Hosea. I'm just going to read the first three verses to start out with, and we'll probably jump all around in the book of Hosea before we're done. All right, it says, The word of the Lord came unto Hosea, the son of Bere, in the days of Uzzah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, in the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms, and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom in departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer of the daughter of uh, Delalim, uh, which uh, conceived and bare him a son. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you be with me as I stand before your congregation this morning. I pray as I always do, not out of vain repetition, but out of necessity, that you help me to stand in the power of the Spirit of God. I pray that you'd recall things to my remembrance that I've studied. And Lord, I pray that you'd help me to say only those things you'd have me to say. And I pray that you'd take those words spoken and apply them to the hearts of each and every person here where they have need. If there's someone here who needs to know you in salvation, I pray that today would be that day of salvation. I pray also, Lord, if there's some here backslidden, that today would be the day of restoration. Or if there's some here who began to backslide and they don't even know it, Maybe they backslidden some in their hearts. I pray that you'd help them to realize their condition and turn their eyes back towards you. It's in Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now let me give you a little bit of background to this book of Hosea. Now the background is this. God was Israel's king. He spoke uh, to the people through the prophets at that time. Yet the people of God wanted to be like all the surrounding nations around them. Now that sounds very familiar, by the way. Uh, the church is called out to be a peculiar people. We're called out to be different, but many in the church want to be like the world, like everybody else. That's why you see churches looking like a nightclub nowadays or looking like a concert hall. Uh, we are to be different. We are to act different. We're to speak different. We are to be different. We're to look different. But Israel wanted to be like the other nations, much like uh, the church. And Christians today want to be like the world. And I tell you, that's wrong. We should be different. Now, that's a shame. They wanted a man for a king instead of God. And that's what many people today want, too. I see uh, that history certainly does repeat itself, doesn't it? People want to listen to men instead of what God says. We get a lot of preachers who do not preach God's word, that they preach what man wants to hear, and they preach man's wisdom. But what we need is not man's wisdom, uh, but God's wisdom. Amen. What we need is not man's word, but God's word. But they wanted a man for a king, so God allowed them to have what they wanted. And that's what I'm fearful of here in our own country, that God may just give the people what they want. We should want him. We should want God to reign here in our country. We should want uh, to uh, uh, live righteous lives as a nation. But I tell you what, we've certainly turned away from him, haven't we? And I'm afraid God's going to give us what we want. We've started, the, as a nation, we've started to turn God away from our institutions. And God's saying, well, I'm going to leave then. I think about Israel there in the book of Ezekiel. They didn't want God. They had set up images in the temple itself. And you know what happened? Uh, the glory of God left the Holy of Holies, went out the holy place, went outside the gate of the temple, went to the Mount Olivet, and ascended up. The glory of God departed. And I'm afraid that's what we're going to get. Unless we turn to the Lord, folks. Unless we follow that pattern that he laid forth there in the scriptures that we humble ourselves and pray, turn from our wicked ways and seek his face, we're not going to see this land healed. But if we'll do that, I believe he'll honor that promise. Even though it was made to another nation, God does not change. And I believe God will honor that with us. They chose Saul. You know why they chose Saul? They chose him because he was a head taller than everybody else. Isn't that a foolish way to choose a ruler? Is he going to be a better ruler because he's taller than everybody else? That's a foolish thing. 
I mean, if you're going to choose a ruler to rule over a godly nation, wouldn't you want to find somebody who's spiritually taller instead of physically taller? I mean, no doubt there's some godly tall men, but there's some ungodly ones too. Being tall don't make you smarter. Matter of fact, you got less air up there. You probably don't get as much oxygen to your brain. Brother Bob back there shaking his head no. But they wanted a man as their king, and God gave them exactly what they wanted. They walked by sight, and they looked by sight. They were sensual, just like people today are sensual, and all they're about is what they can see. However, we know that Saul might have started out doing okay. His heart turned away from God, and he didn't listen to the prophet. He didn't listen to the word of God. And when you don't listen to the word of God, what happens? You make shipwreck of your life. Amen. And he certainly made shipwreck. And he continued down a path that would lead him to the witch of Endor because he didn't listen to God. And if we don't listen to God, folks, this country is never going to be great. we got to listen to God. It shows us here that appearances mean little. God chose David. David was not of a great stature. David did not. Uh, David was a keeper of sheep, means, meaning he was one of the lowliest in his family, the youngest at least. He was ruddy and of a fair countenance. He didn't look like a warrior. But God said, I looked him on his heart. God chose David. God looks on the heart, folks. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't care about your outward appearance. You certainly should. Amen? But your heart's important. A lot of people, that's all they do is work on their outward appearance. But the inward man is more important than the outward man. And what's on the inside works its way to the outside. That same thing's true in rottenness. If you have rottenness on the inside, it'll work its way outward. You may cover it up well, but it'll work its way out. And the same thing's true about uh, following the Lord. It starts in here and it works its way outward. Kind of like the little kid who was in Sunday school class and, and the teacher was saying, you need to invite Jesus into your heart. And she, she couldn't understand that. She's thinking, how in the world can this man fit inside of my heart? You know, kids always take stuff literally. And she finally raised her hand and said, Teacher, if I, if I ask Jesus to come to my heart and he gets in there, he's so big he's going to be sticking out all over the place. And that's what's true. If Jesus is in your life, if he's in your heart, if he's in your inward man, he will stick out all over the place. In your life. God chose David. Now, after David died, and I tell you what, I could preach a long time on the life of David. I did a series on it that lasted months, but we'll skip that and go to his successor, his son uh, Solomon. He, he reigned, and God gave him great wisdom, but he didn't apply that wisdom. You can have a lot of wisdom, but it needs to be applied in your life. You can know a great many things, but you need to see those things applied. You can know what's right and still do wrong, right? You can be raised in church and know what you ought to do and not do it when it comes down to it. You'll stand before God on what you did with what he gave you. But anyways, he didn't, he, he, he followed uh, his wife, he had many wives and he let them turn his heart away from God. And you can blame the wives all you want to, uh, but he's the one that allowed them to do it. We always want to blame other people, ain't we? I mean, I mean, it's as old as time. I mean, uh, when God made uh, the first man and he, he ate of that fruit, which God told him not to eat, when he was asked about it, he said, it was a woman you gave to me. And then the woman said, it was a serpent that, that made uh, Everybody wants to blame somebody else. But what you got to do is come to God the way of the Isaiah did. He said, woe is me. I'm a man under I have sinned and my people have sinned. Come to God. That's how you get saved. You got to realize you're a sinner. You need salvation. That's how you're effective in the work of God. You realize that you need his help. You can't do it without him. But anyway, Solomon has a son, and the son's name is uh, Rehoboam. Now, Rehoboam comes in the power, and his daddy had driven the people hard, and he had made them uh, to work hard, and they built a lot of structures and made the kingdom great. So the older men who were in the kingdom of 
uh, Solomon said uh, to your own Rehoboam, Solomon's son, you need to be easier on the people. Your dad rolled them hard and put them up wet. That's an old southern term. I don't know if he used that term, but he said they was hard on them. Be nicer to them. But then the young people said, well, your, your daddy chastised them with whips. You chastise them with scorpions. You drive them even harder. And you know what advice he listened to? Listen to the whelps. Listen to the young people. Now, young people have a lot to contribute to the work of God. And praise the Lord uh, for the young people who still have the vigor to do that work. But there's something to be said about the wisdom of elders. Those who have been through it. Those who understand the battle. Those who have been through many fights. You should listen to those folks. You should take heed to what they say. And he certainly should have listened to them, but he didn't. He took the bad advice of the young people. By the way, some folks say we ought to worship the Lord according to what the young people want. Huh? Well, let's make it where they, they'll come and where they'll like it a lot more and you make the church more and more watered down and more like the world. But that's not what young people need. People need the strong standing of the godly people who's been through it. They need to hear the word of God preach. That ought to be the primary thing in church. Not that you can wiggle to the music, but that the music will minister to your heart and cause things to change in your heart. Where the preaching is not just antidote after antidote, object lesson after object lesson, and shallow. But that the word of God could penetrate deep into their inner being. And make a change and take root and grow. But he listened to the young people. So what happens? The people revolt and rebel. A guy named Jeroboam takes Ten of the twelve tribes and establishes a new kingdom in the north. And Rehoboam is left with two, uh, uh, two of the twelve kingdoms. Rehoboam has Benjamin and Judea. And then the rest of the twelve tribes are up north with Rehoboam. Up there up north they set up golden calves to worship. Instead of God. They're worshiping golden calves. Now he should have known better than that. Didn't they set up a golden calf while Moses was up on top of the mountain talking to God? Yeah. God didn't like that too much, did he? God instructed Moses to grind that cow up, that gold calf, and make them drink it. But they went ahead and they'd done like their forefathers, followed in their folly. I mean, just because somebody's an elder too don't mean they know what they're talking about too. Huh? <laughs> But they followed in the folly of their fathers. They, they set up a calf in Dan and in Bethel. They worshiped Baal, the sun god, just like the heathen nations. I told you they wanted to be like the heathen nations. Well, a lot of them went ahead and, and become like the heathen nations, and they worshiped the heathen nations' god. And I tell you what, here in America, uh, we certainly want to worship uh, the nations as gods, don't we? Our god is the Lord God, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our god. But many want to worship the gods of entertainment. Many want to worship the gods of their own belly. But who we should worship is the one who died for us, folks. Him alone should be lifted up. They worship Moloch, a terrible, terrible god. A false god, I may add. He had, had bronze hands that would reach out like this and they would take their children, their babies, and they'd lay their babies in those brazen hands that were uh, hot with the coals and embers underneath and it would destroy their children and burn them with fire. They sacrificed their children to Moloch. In America, we're sacrificing our children today to convenience. You hear what I said? No wonder God has allowed a plague in our land. No wonder we're under the judging hand of God. It's time for the people of God to stand up. Amen. Amen. Now, I say all that, not because I'm down a sidetrack, not because I'm down a rabbit trail. I said that to say this, this is the times that Hosea lived in, and this is the times you live in. Very similar 
Hosea preached what we call an action sermon. And I believe all of us really should preach action sermons. Our lives should be a sermon to this lost and dying world. After all, the Apostle Paul said, By inspiration of God, ye are our epistles known and read of all men. Then he preached the action sermon. Now, uh, Isaiah had done the same thing. He walked the streets for three years dressed like a pri prisoner of war. Showing that God uh, would judge Israel. Uh, Jeremiah wore a yoke for several months. Ezekiel um, got a tile and played war, as it were. And he had to eat some terrible stuff, too, by the way, if you read the book of Ezekiel. But however, no one preached a more painful action sermon than Hosea. He was told to marry a prostitute there in chapter 1, verse 2. He might have said, God... I can't marry a prostitute. I'm a prophet. People look up to me. What are they going to think if I marry a prostitute? Well, what, what you need to realize, Jose, is his ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. May not make sense to you, but God knows better than you do. Just do what he says. Isn't that a good lesson for everybody? You may not understand everything. Why has God allowed this? Why did God do this? But God's ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. We just need to trust him in everything. Her name was Gomer. Now that tells me a lot. I don't, I don't know if I'd be interested in a girl named Gomer. Automatically when I say Gomer, I know what you're probably thinking of the exact same thing I'm thinking of. Well, Shazam. That's the Gomer I'm thinking of, but... Anyways, she bore him three children. And by the names of these children, two of them, Hosea wasn't sure were his. She was unfaithful to him in chapter 2, verse 5. It talks about that. Eventually she left him for another, and soon she found herself in a mess. Her former lovers lost interest. And by the way, she learned a lesson that everybody needs to learn. Beauty fades. Amen. Young men, beauty fades. You may find you a girl who's a knockout. But I tell you what, that's not what your primary thing you ought to be looking for. That's not what it is because that's going to fade. Amen. You need to find you a lady that's got a beautiful spirit about them. Amen. That's more important. I know, I know, fellas, I know. I'm a man myself. But I'm telling you, beauty fades. Because what's going to matter is that person that lives inside of that, that body. That's what's going to matter. Youth fades. And I tell you what, they've certainly faded with her. And they abandoned her in chapter 2, verse 7. Finally, she sold herself for a, as a slave, or her creditors took her as a slave to pay her debts off. Either way, she made, her, made shipwreck of her life. What a miserable place we can learn from this that sin will bring you. It'll take you further than you want to go, and it'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cause you to pay more than you ever wanted to pay. Amen. It may have been fun for a while running off on her husband. It may have been fun for a while uh, cheating here on the side and cheating over there. He never knew about it, maybe she thought. But the chickens come home to roost. And she found herself uh, without. Sin will bring you to that place, folks. Yet while she stood on the auction block, broken, miserable, and guilty, out steps Hosea. He still loves her, and he buys her back. Praise the Lord. Can you imagine how she felt as he bought her back? Well, if you're saved, you know exactly how she felt. Huh? You were a slave to sin. Your life was in shambles. It was a wreck. But Jesus Christ bought you by his precious blood. As she saw Hosea step out with her love still uh, toward her, his, her heart, I'm sure, broke loose with the fireworks of heaven. And even so, your heart ought to break forth with the fireworks of heaven when you think about Jesus Christ who bought you with his precious blood. Amen. Amen. You ought to know what that feels like. Now let's examine the meaning of this action sermon. Now, primarily in, in interpretation, in strict interpretation, Hosea represents God and Gomer represents Israel. 
God was a great husband to Israel. God called Israel out of the Ur of the Chaldees through Abraham, and he made promises to Abraham, I'll make you a great nation. Y'all know those promises. He provided for Israel. He would have been their God, but they started turning away from him as soon as he called them out. As the nation began to grow, their hearts began to grow away from him. Israel was unfaithful. They turned to Baal and to Moloch. They played the spiritual harlot, as you can read that phrase repeated over and over again in the Old Testament, going out upon every green hill, playing the harlot. They committed spiritual adultery. They forsook the fountain of living waters, as Jeremiah put it, and hewed out cisterns, broken cisterns that would hold no water. So God chastised them to bring, uh, to bring them home, to bring them back to him. He allowed Assyria to conquer them. And the gods of the Syrians were one of their lovers. He used their own lovers to chastise them. But on Calvary, nearly 2,000 years ago, he bought them back. You hear what I just said? He bought them back. Now, when Christ died on the cross, he died for the sins of the whole world, everybody. There is not an unlimited atonement. Christ died for the sins of the whole world. He invites the whole world to come. But he paid for the, the sins of all mankind. He paid also for the sins of Israel when he done that. One day, Israel will receive him. Now, they rejected him when he came the first time. There were some Jews that got saved. Of course, the disciples were Jewish. They started there in Jerusalem, and they won the Jewish people to the Lord there in Jerusalem, but the nation as a whole rejected Christ. Remember Pilate said, well, you have the king of the Jews. They said, well, now I have this man to reign over us. The apostle Paul was a Jewish man. He went out through all the Gentile world preaching the gospel of Christ, but he'd start in the synagogues to the Jew first. And then he'd get a core of believers there. They'd go stretch out into the Gentiles once again. The church primarily is made up of Gentiles. And by the way, the Bible says in Christ Jesus there's neither Jew nor Gentile. You know, there's many that make the same mistake. The Jews thought that they would be saved because they were Jews. But Jesus said of the stones I can raise up children unto Abraham, they had to come through Christ. There's a nation, though, they rejected him. Matthew chapter 13, I believe uh, the, the buried treasure is referring to Israel. He found the treasure in the Ur of the Chaldees, and he buried it, and then he went and he bought the field. One of these days, he will heal Israel's backsliding. As a nation, they will receive him. Not every Jew is going to receive him, but the nation as a whole will receive him. Now, listen to this. Uh, chapter 14, verse 4, here in Ho Hosea, it says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned away from him. I will be as the due to Israel. He will turn to Israel again. Now, there's a, there's a doctrine I have to call replacement theology. I don't buy that one bit. We don't replace Israel. God does not... Give promises to people and take them away and give them to other people. We called that something back when I was a kid. Probably not uh, politically correct nowadays, but we used to call it being an Indian giver. God will keep those covenants. He will keep those promises. Now, that's the interpretation. Let me give you the application, and this is where you really need it. You need the application. Nobody in here is of the house of Israel, are they? I don't see anybody in the Israelites in here. This is the application. Now, scriptures have one interpretation. One. No prophecy of scripture is given of any private interpretation. It can't mean one thing to me and one thing to Hufford over there. It means one thing. But a scripture can have multitudes of applications. And we're going to give the application that you need right now. That's why all the Bible's important to the Christian church. 
Because all prophecy of Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is prophet for doctrine, for correction, reproof, and instruction in righteousness. So let's apply Hosea to the Christian life here. Now, in, in chapter 1, verse 2, Hosea is told to get a wife of whoredoms. That says quite a bit in it. Now, Hosea is a can certainly apply to the Lord Jesus Christ, and Gomer certainly going to be a picture of us. It can't apply to us, can it? I mean, see lowly, sinful Gomer approached by the prophet of God. He's on a different plane than she is. And even so it is with us. See the contrast. I hope you can see it. We were sinful and we were shameful. We were in our own dirt. We were on our own sin. We were sinking down to the miry clay. But along came the Lord Jesus Christ and offered himself to us. We didn't deserve it. I think of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He knew no sin, but we had sin. We talked about this in Sunday school. In Isaiah 53, he is a man of sorrows, but whose sorrows were they? Well, he says he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. But the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. We were nothing, folks. As David said many years ago, he said, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? And we were nothing that God should have come down and died for us, but he did because he loved us. He endured the great contradiction of sinners. He humbled himself and died for us. You might think a lot of yourself, but I got news for you. Without Christ, you're a child of wrath. We all like sheep have gone astray. We were all in our filthy rags of our own righteousness when Christ found us. We were like that baby that one of the prophets was talking about uh, that was in its own filth out in the field uh, where its cord hadn't been cut and we were dying, but he come and he found us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened in the spirit. I see in Gomer and Hosea a relationship that we can have in Christ Jesus. Now, in, Isaiah, in Matthew chapter 13, I said, I believe that that treasure is talking about Israel that was dug, it was found, and then buried again, and he bought the field. Well, the next parable is the parable of the parable of the pearl of great price. I believe that's the church. A man saw a pearl. It was of great price. And he went and he sold everything that he had. He might buy that pearl. That pearl that he bought is the church. The great price that he paid for that pearl was his own very life that he gave upon Calvary. I've heard people misinterpret. Matter of fact, Charles Spurgeon even misinterpreted that, that parable. We didn't sell everything we had to buy Christ. We couldn't buy Christ. We have no coin. Christ had to buy us. We're the pearl of great price. I don't know. I, I think about how, how, where the pearl comes from. Christ, think about where Christ brought us from. You see, in Sychar, Jesus came to that woman at the well. Came to where she was. He knew where she would be, and he came to where she was. At a certain time, he knew that woman would be at the well, and he told the disciples, I must needs go to Samaria, because he knew exactly where she would be. And when he met that woman, he began to converse with her and speak to her about living water. And she says, give me some of that living water. And you know what Jesus did? He gave her that living water, and she's never thirsted again, folks. She was in sin when she got there, though. She'd had five husbands and was shacking up with somebody that wasn't her husband. But what did Christ do? He made all the difference. Came to where she was. Saved her. Changed her life. I think about that woman caught in adultery in the very act. They were all ready to stone her, but what did Christ do? He showed mercy to her. 
He said, he that is without sin cast the first stone. And when everyone who had sin uh, dropped their stones, Christ still stood there. And certainly he had committed no sin. He could have picked up that stone and condemned her, but he chose not to. He chose to save her and have mercy. He'll have mercy if you'll come to it. Another thing we see here in application of the book of Hosea is her unfaithfulness. As Hosea was uh, faithful to, to Gomer, Gomer was not to her, but he was faithful to her. God's always faithful. Now, I can't say that about myself. I've not always been faithful. There's things that I should do that I don't do. There's things that I shouldn't do that I do. And you say, I can't believe you, preacher. Well, I'm in good company. Paul said about the same thing. But God has never failed me one single time. Amen. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies are new each morning as uh, Jeremiah knew. He gives me grace. I didn't deserve it, but he gave it to me anyway. Hosea was faithful to Gomer. And we see that in chapter 2, uh, uh, verses 7 and 8. Let's turn over there real quick. It says, and she... Uh, shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. She shall seek them, uh, but shall not find them. She shall, shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for uh, then was it better with me than now? For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Even while she was unfaithful to him, he was faithful to her. He kept giving to her. She didn't even know he was giving to her. She didn't even have sight of it. And I told you, there's a multitude of things that God does for you every day that you don't even recognize. He was always faithful to her. Jesus has always been faithful to us. And yet often, like Gomer, we're unfaithful to him. You see here in the text, her ingratitude. I tell you, we often do that, don't worry. We're ungrateful to the Lord. I, I taught in Sunday school about Isaiah 53, and we talked about all that Christ endured for us. And how little we do for him. We're, un, we're, in, we're not gracious. We're not, we don't have any gratitude. I talk about her. We see her hypocrisy is very well known here in verse 8. She did not know that I gave her oil and wine, which they prepared for Baal. Took the good things that was given, give, done something else with it. We play the hypocrite often, don't we? Examine yourself, Christian. Are you backslidden? Are you unfaithful to the God who saved you? Are you unfaithful to the one who gave everything for you? Are you living up to what you ought to be? Are you content with where you're at with God? Well, i got news for you. You should never be content with what you've given to Christ. You should always desire to give more and give more and give more and continue to give more every day of your life. Don't ever think you've got to a spiritual plane where you can set it on cruise control. You need to just continue to go forward and walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not going forward, you're going backwards. If you stop growing, you die. Meaning you become ineffective. Don't be like Samson. The Bible says that when he shook himself after Delilah had trimmed to cut his hair off, he said he shook himself as before to fight those Philistines, and he said it wist not that the power of God had gone from him. He went to lay a punch maybe into one of those uh, Philistines, and he's used to them just falling to the ground, but this time the guy just stood there. He lost the power of God and didn't know it. How many Christians today have lost the power of God and don't even know it? They backslidden into their hearts and they think they're all right. You've got content. You've got complacent. You're spiritually asleep. You need to be aroused from that slumber, folks. But Samson found his strength again when he prayed and asked the Lord to forgive him. If you're backslidden, folks, if you've stopped growing, if you've got become complacent, you need to ask him to forgive you. 1 John 1, 9 is a very important verse for Christians. This is not for lost people. This is for Christians. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you failed him, instead of continuing on down that path of failure until you're ineffective for God, ask him to forgive you and help, ask him to help you to overcome and be what you need to be for his name's sake. 
We see here her unfaithfulness. Are you unfaithful? And then we see her chastisement. Now, chastisement needs to be preached in more Baptist churches. Say amen. A lot of these preachers out there that preach works salvation, they say, them old Baptists, they believe you can get saved and do whatever you want to do. I don't believe that. Amen. Do you believe that? No, I don't. The Bible don't teach that. Now, I do. Now, the Bible teaches that once you're saved, you're always saved. He'll, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's what it says. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, we, we, we give an eternal life. What's that mean? That means forever and ever and ever, doesn't it? He says, he'll, they shall never perish. I mean, never means never. But that doesn't mean you can sin and do whatever you want to and God not care. The Bible says he'll chastise you. Over and over again, I've preached to you uh, Hebrews chapter, I believe it's chapter 12, where it says that if you're in dirt chastisement, you're good, you're a son. But if you're not chastised, it says you're a bastard and not a son, you're illegitimate. She's chastised here. He finally takes it away. He, he gave to her for a season and he stopped giving to her. He says there in verse 9, he says, Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof, and the wine in the seasons thereof. I will recover uh, my wool and my flax, given to cover her nakedness, and I will discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of my hand. God said, well, I'm just going to let her go that way. I'm going to remove my hedge of protection from her. I'm going to let her find out what it's like without me. I'm not going to divorce her, but I'm going to let her go her own wicked way. And he let her go her way. There was a time when Hosea had enough. He let her go to her lovers. He, he took his care away. This is what Christ does, the continual backslider. He does not divorce, but he lets us walk our own sorrowful way that we may see. And we might reach rock bottom and see where we're at without him. He does it, though, for our good. Chastisement is not for his pleasure, uh, but for our betterment. He chastises and he waits. I think about it this way. I can't remember where it says this, but uh, God says to Israel, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. He says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Well, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He says, let us reason together. You're, you're starting to go astray. Let's reason. Let's talk about it. But you know what Israel does? They don't reason. They continue on. They turn away from God. So what does God do? God speaks louder to them. After he speaks louder to them, he begins to take out the chastening rod. And he begins to chastise. And the further they go away, the louder he gets and the harsher it gets until he allows them to go their own way and make shipwreck of themselves. He did that with Israel. He does that with Christians. Chastisement. He removes our peace and our provision that we might come to ourselves. Think about that prodigal son. Now, I know the primary, the primary interpretation of the prodigal son is that he was lost when the father went and found him, just like the lost coin before that, and the lost sheep, the, the lost parables. But there's an application there in that this father let his son go out into the far country, gave him what he wanted. You see the application there? He spent all that he had. He lived it up for a while. He had riotous living. He lived up. Everybody was his friends, but when he ran out of money, the Bible says no man gave to him. And after he had spent all he had, no man gave to him. He looked, he was uh, feeding swine, which he shouldn't have been doing because he was a, a Jewish person, and the swine were unclean creatures, but it took him further than he wanted to go. He looks down at that food and says, man, that, that corn husk looks good. That hog slop looks good. But how much better did I have it in my father's house? How much better did I have it there? The Bible says he came to himself and he went back to the father. God sometimes lets us have what we want that we may come to ourselves and realize that it was so much better with him. The prodigal lost his food. He lost his job. He lost his testimony. Such is the way of a backslider. You need to come to yourself and return to the Father. 
And then the last thing I want you to see here is, is Hosea taking Christ back in application of the church. Look at her condition, chapter 2, verse 6. It says, Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns, and I will make a wall that she may not find her path. She shall follow after her lovers, and she shall not overtake them. She shall seek them, and shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better with me than now. Does that not sound just like the prodigal son? That's the way of a backslider. God says, if you don't want me, I'm going to withdraw myself from fellowship with you for a while and let you have exactly what you want, and then you find out you have nothing. you like Naomi. Remember Naomi, the Bible says she went out full, and she said that she uh, changed her name to Mara, which means bitter, because she came back empty. When you go out, you go out full, but when you get out there, you find out you're empty. We see our condition. My father's servants do better uh, than this, the prodigal son. I'll rise. I'm not worthy to be his son. Full of regret. We see her full of regret too. To get away from God is to live a life full of regrets. Don't stay in regret though. You know you can have a, a place back where you left. You know God's waiting to receive you back. He wants you to be restored. He wants you back in his fold. He wants you back in his work. Amen. He wasn't done with Peter when Peter denied him three times and the third time with a curse. God wanted him back in service. And when he come back and he, he repented, when he sought the Lord's face, when he asked him to forgive him, God put him back to work and 3,000 souls got saved at Pentecost and 5,000 souls get saved in the next chapter. You can be used. Again, it's not too late for you if you're still breathing air. You can do God's work. Amen. Amen. You may have made a mess out of everything, but God can still use you. Amen. But you got to confess your sin. You got to forsake the sins, and you got to ask Him. There was nothing she could do. She's full of regret. There she is on the auction block, slave now. But all the power was in God's hand. All the power is in Hosea's hands and all the power is in God's hands when it comes to us. Her old lovers didn't want her no more, but there was somebody who wanted her. The Lord always wants his own back and his will. Chapter 3, we find her on the auction block. This is where you are, backslider. Or you're heading there. But there's hope. Look at chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Then said the Lord unto me, Go get... Uh, Go yet, a lo love a woman beloved of her, her friend, yet an adulteress according to the love of the Lord God toward the children of Israel who look to other gods, who love flagons of wine. So I brought, bought her uh, to me after 15 pieces of silver and for an omer of barley and a half omer of barley. He still loves you. He's got the price in his hand. He already paid it. Come to him. Come to him. Ask for forgiveness. He'll, re, he'll use you. He can fix that, that shipwreck that you've made out of your life. That's what he does. Let's pray.